you to be the judge of this. Do Japanese kickboxers go too hard? And I've got a new microphone. How about that? So let's look at Yuki Yoza's sparring before his last fight. Current K1 lightweight champion and the combinations he does and techniques he pulls out of the bag. A next level. But let's watch this crazy gym spar. So he's sparring with a Westerner. I don't know his name. But as he's starting the spar, he's doing slow low kicks just to get the feel and get the range. You see this a lot in Kyokushin. And then he'll change speed and hit with harder, faster low kicks. There. Little feints in. He's got a very sturdy stance. And there he puts in a very fast calf kick with no wind-up. Because there's no wind-up and there's no real big step across, it lands really clean. He doesn't get his check in time and it knocks him off balance. Yuki Yoza uses his high guard to get in a bit closer and then jab. Sometimes that's a really underrated jab. It's just high guarding in. As soon as you feel it in range, just pumping the jab out there with a vertical fist. There's hand fighting. and I believe that was what some people are calling a Yosa kick. Look at this kick. Look at this kick to the back leg. Let's look at it again if you missed it. So look at Yuki Yosa's left leg. Boom. Just a toe kick to the back leg. Left leg to his opponent's right. And then he's blasting the calf kick in. That's a really dangerous kick. Is I would say it's more dangerous than the oblique kick. Is that kick to the back leg. Here he hits this left kick. Look, look how he looks up to the sky. Looks up to the ceiling first. And then pings it in. Toes wrap around behind the elbow, and then he follows in with combinations. The guy's hitting into the mirror, wanting to take a little, little bit of a breather. His head guard's going all over the place. And look at this. Is this good sparring etiquette? Left knee, left kick to the head. Huh? Watching that back, it looks like it hits with the toes. It doesn't even hit with the pad of the shin. I think he curled his toes in. So there was no protection on that, and the guy's adjusting his head guard. If he goes in the mirrors, he's still fair game, apparently. Back to the high guard, and we're going to see more insane combinations from Yuki Yoza. Just a little move back to avoid the low kick. His, his palms are kind of turned out, ready to check. He'll manipulate his guard. Has a really good jab. He'll jab from close. He got caught pulling back on a 1-2. The guy's taller, like the guy he fought at the end of this training camp. And as he got caught by that 1-2, it was when he was pulling back there. He hits an uppercut hook to the body. It's a very classic combination, whether you go body hook first or uppercut first. One pulls the elbow up, so it opens the body, or it pulls the elbow down, so it opens the uppercut. Then he moves out of range of the return kick. Touches a jab. He's kind of playing with a little bit of a Joe Frazier guard there. Hits a low kick, and then hits the uppercut. See how he loads it up? He moves his head in position first. He gets his head off line, gets his head underneath his opponent. That's kind of blocking the vision, and then there's no real wind up on the uppercut. Just shoots it through. Through the middle of the gloves of his uh, sparring partner here. His very unfortunate sparring partner. See there, this is a beautiful setup. He uses his head to manipulate his sparring partner's guard. He lifts his sparring partner's head up past his own guard. Then he goes uppercut, body hook, uppercut, low kick. And we see a delayed reaction on the liver shot. Tripling up on the lead hand. Really high level. In terms of fight examples, Nicky Holskin versus Joe Valtellini is a really good combination like this. But look how he gets his head underneath his sparring partners to bring him up out of his guard uppercut body hook uppercut then low kick really really good combinations by tripling up on the lead hand and then following with the low kick the more you use your lead hand the more you kind of load yourself up for that right low kick and the more you put their weight onto their left leg so they can't really defend it plus if you've just got smacked with an uppercut and a big body hook you're probably a bit hurting and not thinking about the low kick back to the high guard there's a golovkin style hook you see it a lot in Kyokushin where the knuckles turn down. A lot of the time they hit the, the chest and the sternum in Kyokushin. Two light touches up to the head and then with this Golovkin hook again. He's obviously trying to practice this. And then he mixes the level. Something about that kind of hook is it's very hard to read whether it's going to the body or head. Because he's not loading it up like a classic body hook. He got hit with the right hand a little bit as he's pulling back with his hands down. And a left high kick there. Really nice left high kick. Just snuck it over the left shoulder. The right shoulder even. Because it was close stance. And there's an interesting spinning back kick. Normally, you would see someone throw the right spinning back kick to another orthodox. Because that's the open side. That's where the body is open. It's quite hard to land a left spinning back kick to another orthodox opponent. Because the lead elbow, the left elbow is there and covering it. But he still fits it through. Goes inside low kick. Kind of corrals him. Squares his stance up into that. Left spinning kick. The inside low kick pairs up really well with that spin kick because it kind of squared the guy's stance up for a second. 
and made him think about the attack coming from that side, got him to circle off towards that spinning back kick. Little Easter egg. So fast the boy, the so fast the boy's eerie against the pillar. We can see Masaki no Iri, one of my favorite kickboxers ever. That sweep was kind of like a bit of mercy instead of just following up relentlessly with punch after punch after punch. And that was the end of the round there. It looks like a 30 second rest. Some people are a bit, you know, should you rest 30 seconds? It was a Mickey Ward strategy back in the day. He would rest 30 seconds in his training camp so it would feel longer. I think sometimes, depending on the type of rounds, I actually think for a hard round, probably take the full minute's rest so it's a bit more intense. But we're moving on to the second round here. Let's skip a little bit. Look at those knee pads. You need them in the face with those. And those don't look fit to wrap a chip butty that has a little bit of vinegar on it. Again, see how his palms are kind of turned forwards when he's a bit longer range, so he's ready to parry. And then as he gets closer, he turns his palms in to a more classic kickboxing guard. Low kicking simultaneously, and the low kick takes the guy's balance out. And there's a kick, a low kick to the inside leg, kind of the car for the inside leg. You see a lot more versatility in low kicks and low kick locations from Kyokushin Karatekas. So Yuki is moving forward, kind of seeing what the guy has early in the round, taking the shots on the gloves. A little bit of the slips, a little bit of head movement, there parries across. Double jabbing, triple jabbing. He can hit these jabs really successfully because he gets into range first and then jabs. This is an insane combination. Kind of Kind of questionable with the rules of kickboxing because sometimes they don't like these sweeps or even pushing at all. There was a big thing of glory refs not allowing any pushing, but that's ridiculous. If you watch any of the best kickboxers ever, Masato, Giorgio, Petrosian, they'll push people. And then they ended up with all these fights like Artem Levin versus Simon Marcus where people would just fall into a clinch and they wouldn't be able to break the clinch because they're not allowed to push each other. They get a warning. It's ridiculous. But this is an interesting sweep. And... He'll get away with it in any of his fights in K1 because of Japanese refs, Jap Japanese judges. Well, let's go back a little bit. Look, see how he sets up the left high kick. He works in, he gets in right close. Hits an uppercut, sweeps that back leg out and then hits a left high kick on the Kazushi whilst the guy's off balance and then digs his toes into the body after the high kick whilst his attention's up high. Let's look at it one more time. The up. The uppercut stands him up straight, so he's easy, a push and off balance, and whilst he's off balance, he gets left high kick. The guy should have been focusing on his defense first whilst he was off balance, instead of trying to throw that right hand back, left that big opening for the left high kick. Palms turned out slightly at range, and then the turn in to a more classic boxing guard as he gets closer. Just a slight move back, ready to parry, see how it makes it easier for him to parry when he's a bit bit more at range, even easier to parry the front kicks. So he parries this front kick and kind of gets across him. Turns to a shoulder roll as he gets in close, adapting his guard for the range that he's at. More off balance than Kazushi. And then he triples, quadruples up on the lead hand on this break. Body hook, head hook, jab, body hook again, hits the low kick to the back leg, and then eats a return. And there's another little Yoza kick. Another little digging the toes into the back leg. It's a quite a dangerous kick. There he did a Yoza kick there, and then he does it off the lead leg. He's done it twice. I thought it's, it's more dangerous. More people have their back leg straight, so they can't really brace it. People say the oblique kick's very dangerous, but the lead leg, you can brace it. Unless you're taking stupid steps in, you can brace it. You can almost knee him in the bottom of the foot. But if it's the back leg, that leg's straight. So you really have to be aware of it. There's the toe kick again. He looks up. And then he hits a high kick. He's looking at different levels. When he hits a toe kick, the Chizoku Mawashi Gary to the body, he's looking at the head. When he hits the head kick, he's looking at the body, ready to parry across these kicks. Getting caught a little off balance on his shoulder roll. And then he moves back into southpaw. Palms turn out, stays a little bit longer at southpaw, and then hits a massive kick to the back leg. Even though there wasn't huge setup, it's so hard to check that kick to the back leg because, again, all your weight's on it. Checking my mic still on. All your weight's on that back leg. You can throw that left straight. Even if it doesn't land and it pushes on the shoulder, you can. that's pushing their weight back onto their right leg in this instance. So they can't really step out the way. They can't pick it up and they can hammer that kick in. Another. There was another spinning back kick to 
close side, left spinning back kick. Very interesting. A lot of Japanese kickboxers use that left spinning back kick, even though it's closed and normally that elbow's in the way, but they land it still. Rakia Anpo does. He switches across to land it. Pressure in, doesn't give him that body kick for free. And here he's unloading again, pushes him against the mirror. Knee to the head, and then just takes the base away. So what's interesting about this knee to the head and then low kick combination is when you knee to the head, again, questionable in sparring, but when you knee to the head, your leg has to come down a long way. You're pretty much going in a full split to knee someone in the head if they're tall and they're stood upright in this situation. So it takes a long time to bring that leg back to the floor. And people are going to step in on you and punch. But if the moment your foot touches the floor, you're firing out an inside low kick, boom, boom, it's hard for the guy to fire back. And then he jabs through the middle. I'm seeing a lot of this left leg yoza kick to the back, you know, the back right leg of his orthodox training partner. Blocking with the tight elbow position and then throwing two hooks back. Another round there. Loads and loads of yoza kicks. I don't know, what is the correct weeb name for this kick? Because I think colloquially, people have just started calling it a yoza kick. We saw Masaki Noi reuse it in one of his domestic bouts as well. Round three. Takes a low kick, takes a couple low kicks. Not the biggest low kicks in the world, so he's not really perceiving the threat of them. That's an insane combination. Insane. Let's look at this again. He, a double uppercut. Jab. Double uppercut. Body hook, uppercut. And then low kick again. We saw one earlier, but that even extended it by going quadruple on the lead hand. That double uppercut through the middle. A lot of the times you land one uppercut. The opening is still there for the second one. We saw Naoya Inoue landing the, the, the triple uppercut. And then we saw his brother Takuma Inoue landing the triple uppercut. The most times I've ever seen a triple uppercut landed in his fight was with his fight with Furuhashi. And he landed about double digits of triple uppercuts. But there, the double uppercut makes the opening really well for that left hook body. Another uppercut. All the defense is focused on that side. And then he can leverage in to a really powerful right low kick. Hitting multiple left hands into the right low kick. Always a classic strategy in kickboxing. And then the guy's off balance a bit, trying to use that front kick to keep him away. You also playing with his feints on the outside. It's always a good thing as well, if you do land some really good shots on someone, is just to start to feint as you move in next time, because you've, you've got them on a leash. Instead of swinging hard landing, and then swinging hard again, you've landed a really good combination. Feint before you enter. Volkanovski, if you watch his finish over Yair Rodriguez over the weekend, hit some beautiful feints, really good head feints, shoulder feints, before stepping in to finish Yair Rodriguez. And it makes that finish just a bit more effective. We hit some feints here, and we see a nice, a really nice right high kick. I think it was caught across one glove, a hook cross right high kick, some nice same side striking. There we see that little trip again, pulling the heel and then trying to throw the high kick off it. It's good to high kick people whilst they're off balance. And there's a double up on the Chizoku Mawashigeri to the body. See how he gets his attention up, doubles it, then throws a right straight, left spinning kick to the body, throws a knee to the head again. I don't believe those knee pads have enough padding. And then he just follows into the, the beginner's class or whatever is going on on the other side of that pillar. But very important when he lands that toe kick, he sells upwards so hard with his hips and his eyes. So before he just starts to unload here, he goes for that sweep into the right kick. Goes a left high kick that helps him set it up. So the next time he looks up high, digs the toes to the body. Looks up high, digs the toes to the body. Right straight, spinning kick. And then does some questionable sparring etiquette here by just throwing away like crazy. Knee to the body, knee to the head. They've spilled well into the beginner's class. To be honest, there's probably really good kickboxers there. I, there's probably an experienced class, and they would all fucking toe kick shit out of me. Literally. But they get back into this, back into the middle. You know, you've got a full class going on on one side, a wall full of glass mirrors on the other, and he's ended up swinging punches in combination whilst the guy's stuck on both. The guy's holding his ground a bit more, trying to fire back. I don't know if yours is trying to practice his defense. He went liver shot high kick there, which, which was really nice. Tends to work better on the southpaw. And then he gets high kicked again. There's a little feint before it, a little low feint, and then he comes up with a high kick. 
little twitch. He twitches his eyes low, and that also loads his weight onto that left leg so he can spring it up nice and quick. Boom, boom, left high kick. And then classic goes to the body. Some people really struggle to land that kick with the ball of the foot to the body, all those body kicks, because you need to establish a threat to the head. Sometimes just those flicky, quick left high kicks are really good just to get people's attention up high, and then it can dig to the body. There, his partner's finished now. You tell me if it's good training practice to get a finish in the gym. I wouldn't say so. But I'm not a Japanese lightweight K1 kickboxing champion, so what do I know? Switches southpaw, twitch, high kick. He just loads his weight on the toes, then he goes in, follows in, and he's just alternating his hands there. So that is Yuki Yoza. If you watch Jack Slack stuff, Jack Slack's been on, him, on about him recently. Has some brutal sparring videos. I'm going to... There's no full clips like this. There's no full length videos. But there's some good ones with Takeru where they're just going CTE City. But anyway. If you want more commentaries, breakdowns, don't support my Patreon. Get a flat white. Or even better, an Americano. Because sometimes I want that flat white because it looks so milky and nice. But I'm always happier when I get an Americano. So you should do that too. Get two Americanos. 